Hello everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Game Review. <laughs> My name is Caleb Denby, and today I'm going to be going over a game from, the, from last year's 2019 World Rapid Championship. Uh, it was a very interesting event, and one of the breakout players was Ali Reza Ferruja. He is a 16-year-old from Iran, and he finished uh, with 10.5 points, actually, uh, tied for second place behind the one and only Magnus Carlsen. And today, I wanted to go over one of his games against Ernesto Inarkiev. Uh, Inarkiev is also a very strong player, uh, peaked well over 2700, and uh, gained some, some fame over the past year uh, by claiming an illegal move against Magnus Carlsen, uh, and I think last year's Blitz Championship. Uh, no such controversies this year for Inarkiev, but uh, he did play this game against Ferruja. And I wanted to talk about this game because it's very typical of Ali Reza's style. Um, he, of course, uh, a 16-year-old, has grown up playing chess on the internet, and playing chess on the internet uh, gives you a lot of practical uh, abilities. It makes you play the type of chess where you give your opponent chances to go wrong, and you don't try to you know, force everything. You just make their position slightly awkward and let them kind of blunder at, at their own pace. So let's see how he pulled it off in, in this game against Narkiev. And the game started e4, e5. And we very quickly got into the closed Roy Lopez with knight f6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1, b5. And after a few more moves, we achieved this position uh, after c3. And in this case, uh, black actually chose the main line, knight a5, hitting this bishop, forcing it off of this very natural long diagonal uh, onto this diagonal behind, uh, behind his pawns. And now, black continues with the very natural move, c5. So he gets this knight out of the way and pushes this pawn forward. And the character of this position is usually that, you know, white's pieces are well placed to support some central pushes. And so generally what happens is after a few more moves, we see knight bd2, uh, rook e8, knight f1, knight c6, and generally, uh, the, the tried and true method here is to place some moves like knight g3 and after something like h3 and h6, white's going to go ahead and, and break in the center with d4. And at first, this actually looks like a very, very tempting option for white. It seems to create some, some real problems in, in the black position. Uh, generally, black captures, and after some exchanges on this square, uh, we see that in this position, it seems as though black is left with a very weak D pawn. Uh, but the downside to uh, having so many exchanges so early on is that if black manages to solve this problem of the D pawn, he is going to be completely equal. Uh, white center has been pretty much dealt with. Uh, the, the D pawns have been totally removed from the board for, for white. And if black can just deal with this one weakness, then he's actually going to be totally fine in this game. And we'll see uh, from experience here, there are quite a number of games uh, in this specific line. Black generally just develops this bishop and very, very quickly uh, pushes this pawn to d5. And once black achieves d5, historically this has really not been, uh, not been enough to prove an advantage for white. And in addition to that, with the trade of some of these pieces, the opening of the c file, uh, this is really going to fizzle out into, into a draw. And so this is the type of position that uh, Alireza likes to avoid. He likes to keep more pieces on the board, give uh, his opponent more chances to mess up, and that's how he's getting so many practical chances in all of these games. So with that in mind, let's back up to the game here, after knight c6. So generally, the line I just want looked at, white usually plays something like knight g3 and h3 and pushes d4. Instead, Alireza plays knight e3. And this is really telegraphing that he's not looking to play d4. And the reason for that is this knight is not well placed if this push is what he had in mind. And you might say, well, well why is that? And the reason is you're interfering with this rook's defense of the e pawn. So you can imagine after bishop f8, which was played, now if you attempt something like d4, you're actually going to run into some pretty immediate problems where the pawn's simply going to be hanging thanks to the pressure of the black pieces on the, e on the e file. 
So, with this knight on e3, uh, Ferugia is actually delaying the opening up of the position, kind of passing the ball to black, saying, okay, I'm just going to keep my pieces here and uh, do some stuff on the queen side, and I'll let you decide when you want to open up the center. And so, after bishop f8, which was played, he actually chooses a3, which is a little bit abnormal, and after black's next move, h6, uh, Alireza plays b4. And with this, uh, he's gaining some space on the queen side. He's potentially eyeing even some c4 breaks, and he wants to open up the position over here. Uh, and historically, uh, the way the black has dealt with this, there's a, just a couple games here, one actually between Judith Polger and Alexander Onishuk, uh, way back in 1997. Historically, black has just played a5. And with this, things have kind of been simplified uh, a little bit uh, on the queen's side. White can either take here or here, historically. Uh, in Judith's game, uh, we saw uh, b takes a5, and after rook b1, bishop d7, and a few more moves we'll go through. Knight h2. She looked to play on the king's side now, with this kind of nagging weakness for black. Uh, maybe this is what uh, Alariza had in mind, but we'll never know, because here his opponent, Anarkiev, decided to break in the center with d5. And this is a very interesting decision. It's not so bad for black, really, but it is kind of daring white to, uh, to, to show his hand. By placing this knight on e3, we were actually aiming at this d5 square. We wanted to make this d5 break a little bit more difficult for black to play. Uh, we saw in the standard way of playing, this knight comes to g3, and the problem for white is that black can usually achieve d5 without too much difficulty. And after uh, that occurs, black's problems are, are usually solved. So what's the difference here? It looks as though after we take, takes, takes, and takes, black still doesn't really have any problems. But that can be kind of deceptive. What we've achieved by putting, putting this knight on e3 is rather than bringing a knight to d5, we've drawn this queen all the way up from d8 to d5 and Ferugia looked to make use of the awkward placement of this queen. He does so with the strong pawn break, d4. So what does this move do? It does quite a bit. Um, it creates a lot of tension on the c5 pawn, so it's forcing black to make a decision. And in addition, it's opening up this long diagonal for the bishop, and it's also opening up this e4 square for the bishop. And so you start to see how uh, the black pieces have been drawn to slightly awkward squares. For example, c takes d4 was played. Uh, Ferugia plays the very, very nice move, knight takes d4. It would be a mistake to take back with the pawn, because now black has the opportunity to keep things a little bit more closed with the move e4, locking this pawn uh, on a weak square. So instead, knight takes d4 is powerful, making use of this pin. Bishop b7 was played. And now we see the point of Ferugia's play, bishop e4. Uh, this queen, moving from its awkward square, uh, has now allowed the white pieces to gain quite a bit of activity. And already it's, it's very, very impressive uh, how Ferugia has managed to draw his opponent into putting his pieces on squares that are not quite where, where they want to be. And he's done this by tempting his opponent into playing the, the more natural breaks, uh, even though he has kind of aimed uh, his play against them. And so, while this might not be bad for black at all, it is starting to kind of turn in Ferugia's uh, favor here. He's pushing the black pieces around quite a bit. Uh, okay, this queen comes to c4. Now that this pin on the rook has been broken, the white knight has to move, so it comes to f5. And we see some threats on the king's side starting to come, come about. Uh, black decides he'd like to trade off this, this powerful bishop, so he plays knight d8 which is a perfectly fine move. Uh, Ferugia continues with queen f3. We see bishop c6. And this knight drops back to g3, which is kind of a strange move to my eyes. I think uh, Ferugia was aiming for some, some queen f5 ideas, perhaps trying to uh, bait black into playing g6, but uh, knight g3 still doesn't feel quite right, but white's position is totally fine. We see g6 does come on the board. Now we finally see the trade of the bishops. And now knight e4 aims at some weak dark squares in the black camp. Uh, black remaneuvers this bishop to g7, 
And this is why this knight g3 maneuver didn't make so much sense to me. It really feels like g6 and bishop g7 was something black wanted to play anyways. He puts this bishop opposite this weak pawn on c3, and while it is kind of blocked off by its own pawn for the moment, uh, there's no guarantee that it'll stay that way. Uh, anyways, Ferugia continues with the very natural a4, looking to gain activity uh, and activate his final rook. And now, uh, black finally uh, kind of crumbles. Uh, he simply plays rook c8, which is not such a good move after all. And so after a takes b5, and a takes b5, uh, I'll ask you at home to see if you can find the, the winning tactic here for Ferugia. It's uh, not totally winning the game, but it's very much winning material, and it's giving black uh, quite a few problems to, to solve. And, okay, uh, with that in mind, here's the answer. It's queen h3, which was played in the game. And this is a very, very tricky move, actually. It's actually a, a very simple fork. It attacks the rook on c8 and the pawn on h6. And you might be thinking, well, okay, how, how does this matter at all, right? The, this rook's defended. But if black plays the very, very natural um, king h7 to defend, first of all, there's knight g5 tricks, but secondly, knight d6 would be winning the game here. And that's why this is very, very relevant. Now the queen is overworked. It can't both stop this knight from coming to d6 and defend this rook. And so uh, white is simply winning material. And this would be disastrous for black. Uh, so what black needed to do here was simply play knight e6, allowing white to capture this h-pawn, and then looking for counterplay with this move f5. And this would have been uh, a great way for black to stay in the game. And this is what I meant by saying this bishop is blocked on g7, but it's definitely not going to be permanent. This f5 pawn break uh, could come with, with devastating uh, effect, actually allowing black to roll the center forward and capture on c3. Unfortunately for black, he did not find this, this solution to his problems, instead choosing queen e6, uh, which simply allows the tactic we just looked at. Uh, now, after knight d6, it's the same story. The queen cannot capture this knight, and queen takes h3 doesn't really help. So instead, we see rook takes c3 from black, and after queen c3, Queen d6. We do have to solve this problem, so white plays rook a8, and now white is simply up in exchange for a pawn, and the rooks are getting very, very active for white, and this game is, is pretty much dead lost. Uh, so before we look at the very end of the game, which went on for some time, but was never really out of Farouge's control, let's go back to the key move, rook c8. So this is what I'm talking about when I say uh, I'm mentioning Farouge's experience online and ex his experience in playing tricky chess. So what he's done is he's just placed this knight uh, on this e4 square, and it doesn't really look threatening from e4. But in fact, it's looking at some very dangerous squares. And so while on e4, it's not making any immediate threats, it's giving uh, his opponent the chance to allow any of these three moves to, to become strong. And so, of course, what Anarkiev should have done is realize the danger that this knight really poses and immediately played this move, f5. This is the move that uh, should have been played at, at actually a couple moments for black. This f5 move, like I said, forces this knight off this, c4, or off this e4 square. And once we continue with e4, uh, and this queen will have to move out of the way, uh, let's say to d1, all of a sudden there are some very, very serious threats on this, this c3 pawn that white is going to have to contend with. It's going to be a very active bishop, and uh, this would be a, a very, very nice position for black, actually. Of course, black can't capture immediately due to the check, but you can imagine a simple knight f7 move, rerouting this knight, now looking at some of these open squares and defending against any checks on the, the diagonal, and this position would be quite favorable for black. Instead, though, we did see rook c8, of course, and now after takes and queen h3, black immediately crumbled under the pressure, losing the exchange, and we'll play through the last few moves. Bishop f8, bishop e3, queen d7, bishop c5, bishop g7. Of course, in Arkiev, trying to keep pieces on the board, trying to keep chances alive, but queen f3, knight c6, takes, takes, queen d5, queen c8, 
and now rook a1, and the end is, is really near. You see the coordination between the rook and the queen and the bishops, and it's simply too much for the black pieces to handle. Uh, black tried e4, attacking this rook, very sneaky. Uh, we see rook e1, knight e5. Now the e pawn falls, and after king h7, bishop d4, knight c4. We see a trade of pieces, always good to trade down when you're up material. Queen d4 check, king g8, h3. I like this move in rapid chess, you know, just why, why, why even think about hanging back rank mate? Just play h3. See h5, and now the queen and the rook work together, aiming at some unfortunate squares around this black king. We see the trade. Now after knight a3, rook c5. It's very clear which piece is better in this endgame, and this knight actually quickly became trapped. White simply walks the king over to the queen's side and looks to collect this final piece of blacks. See rook c2, king d5, and in this position, black ended up resigning. And so this was uh, a game that happened pretty, er pretty early on in the tournament, actually, for Ruja, but I think it's, it's a very typical, typical game. It seems as though he didn't really do anything super special. He didn't try to positionally, you know, dominate his opponent. Uh, all he does is play very practical chess that gives him fighting chances. Uh, he allowed his opponent to make a mistake, and then he immediately found the tactic. He immediately capitalized. And ever since, uh, you know, he went up material, the game was never in doubt. He, you know, employed perfect technique and won the game without too much of a struggle. Uh, with that in mind, thank you all for joining me for the very first episode of Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.